Hi, I'm Emma Hewlett. I'm Amy Mulder. I'm Caitlin Nachai. I'm Mary Kratushniak. I'm Tara Zaniel, and we're going to be presenting on the Beekeeper's Guide to the Plants of the Aspen Parkland. Sarah Willens is the owner and operator of the Wildflower Bride Farms, which is east of Hay Lakes or 31 kilometers northwest of Camrose, Alberta. Sarah is a retired pharmacist turned beekeeper when she decided to move to Alberta to manage her own apiary. The farm has the distinction of being on the highest hill between Hay Lakes and Thunder Bay and features sloping hills, valleys, rolling pastures, and a year-round pond. The farm is located in the Aspen Parkland ecoregion, and this ecoregion has a diverse flora and fauna that runs through the prairie provinces in Canada. The main product produced on the wildflower bride farms is the honey created from Sarah's 33 Western honeybee hives. Not only is there abundance of bees on Sarah's farm, there are also a number of different livestock, such as cattle, sheep, and chickens. For our deliverable, our sponsor Sarah was looking for a small booklet that consists of the large variety of the Aspen Parkland plants that are located on her farm. Each plant will have its own page, which includes a picture of the plant, the Latin name, its key identifiers, the best habitat for growth, and its blooming period. She also asked us to search for whether the plant supplies pollen, nectar, or both, how to extend the blooming period, and the effects on honey. Some of the plants can be beneficial for honeybees, but dangerous for animals. So since she has livestock and pets on her farm, we wanted to add a list of poisonous plants that could harm the animals. We're also going to leave some space for new information she learns. And some of the plants that we had to research did not have all the information we were looking for, which is another reason why there's some space for Sarah to add any notes. Uh, this booklet, will be very useful for Sarah and other beekeepers in the Aspen Parkland area. Since it's going to be a small booklet, it can be carried around while working on the farm, which they can then use this as a quick guide for a fast look of, of the plants they have in front of them. This would be one of the fastest and most effective ways for Sarah and other farmers to learn about the land plants. Bees and beekeeping can be used as a sustainable means for helping the environment. Bees are natural pollinators and have served as such for humans dating back decades, if not centuries. However, with the recent decline in bee populations in the wild, it's important for beekeepers to have information to keep from their own hives from experiencing a similar fate. Sarah wished to learn more about the plants that grew on her farm in hopes of improving the conditions for bee-friendly plants and also being able to help remove harmful plants that would be detrimental to her bee populations as well as her livestock. By encouraging these bee-friendly plants, she would, Sarah would be able to foster a more extensive population growth and be able to create less damage to the bee populations that she's raising. But beekeeping also has a social aspect of a sustainability. With this project, Sarah wished to obtain more information about the plants that grew on her farm so that she would not only have the added information for herself, but be also able to pass it on to others. As she does give lectures and has questions asked about beekeeping, she will be able to give that information to them more easily than if they or was no source. And as traditionally beekeepers were only kept their information themselves or just pass it on to a few people, having such a booklet to reference would prove to be more efficient and helpful for passing on knowledge to more people then just either by exchanging word of mouth or keeping that information only to a few select parties that are interested in beekeeping. Human society, the natural environment and economics are not to be considered separate entities when discussing sustainability, but rather interconnected parts of a whole. 
From this perspective, this project's social and environmental sustainability benefits will also help economically benefit Wildflower Bride Honey Farm in a sustainable way. Economic sustainability focuses on counteracting the current system based on overuse of finite resources. So helping Sarah create this tool to enhance her business, which is based on renewable plant resources native to the land, both boosts her economic capacity and allows her to contribute to the economy in a sustainable manner. Meetings with Sarah. In our first meeting with Sarah, she explained exactly what she was looking for, which was a booklet that had the five following plant categories, native and non-native flowers, pasture plants, shrub and wetland plants, and trees. After naming the five categories, Sarah gave us what information she was looking for on the booklet and how much detail she would like us to put into the research. Organizing our work. After the first meeting, we divided up the categories and all chose a topic to take on. We talked about how we wanted the booklet to look like and many ideas were shared on how to make it look the best with the resources we have. We also had a meeting deciding what part everyone would look after for the executive summary and presentation. Research. We shared many websites with each other that we thought could be a great help to others research. Throughout the past three weeks, we have met numerous times as a group and discussed the information we have found and if we were having troubles. Modifications. In our second meeting with Sarah, we brought up some of the troubles we were having with the information and she gave us some suggestions on what to do if we couldn't find anything. The biggest problem was finding out how exactly the plant could affect the bee's honey and how to extend the blooming time. Sarah gave us the idea to add a note section at the end of each page so that she could make her own notes if she discovered more information while working in the fields. My main focus was on the native flowers. Sarah had a keen interest in learning more about fireweed, sunflower, honeysuckle, wild aster, wild red raspberry, and the wild rose. In particular, she asked for extra information on sunflowers, specifically on which kinds native to the Aspen Parkland would be most beneficial for honeybees and honey production. I was able to find two such species being the common sunflower and the rhombic leaf sunflower. Sarah also wanted to know more on fireweed and how to increase and reproduce it. Now, while I wasn't able to find more on how to reproduce it, I was able to find some information on how to ensure fireweed grows and maintains a healthy stance throughout its life. Fireweed best grows in partial to full sunlight, preferably near large bodies of water. I was also able to learn that fireweed is considered one of the most prolific honeybee plants in the Northern Hemisphere with honey yields from 50 to 120 pounds per colony. Thus, the flower provides a primary food source for bees in the Aspen Parkland. I researched the non-native flowers, which consisted of borage, sow thistle, Canada thistle, wild carrot, tansy, and common dandelion. Sarah was specifically interested in Canada thistle, as she believes it's one of the plants that gives her honey a signature floral taste. I discovered that Canada thistle is a great source of both pollen and nectar. The clusters of the small flower heads produce an abundant ab amount of nectar. This plant provides a light honey with a fine texture and a mild flavor. I also found that borage has many health benefits such as anti-cancer properties, it can treat PMS and menopause symptoms, and it can be used for hyperactive digestive, respiratory, and cardiovascular disorders. Another interesting point I found is about sow thistle. Sow thistle is, when sow thistle is decaying, it can release chemicals that can negatively affect the seed germination of other species but it is a beneficial feed for livestock and foraging animals as well. Also, I found that tansy can be toxic to horses, cattle, and harmful to humans as well. My research focus was on the pasture plants found in the Aspen Parkland. Pasture plants are 
defined and categorized as temperate or tropical grass, temperate or tropical legumes, native and non-native grass that grows in open grassland regions. Pasture plants are plentiful in the Aspen Parkland and many of them are used for feed for livestock. However, some of them are poisonous to livestock as well. Sarah wants to know how often bees use these species and the potential side effects on her livestock. The species Sarah wanted me to research are the acylate clover, the white clover, the purple prairie clover, the red clover, the yellow sweet clover, alfalfa, floodsman's thistle, and the purple milk vetch. Although I will not cover every species I researched, I will cover the more interesting pasture plants and the research I found about them. The alcylate clover offers desirable resources to honeybees, boasting as a great source of both pollen and nectar for the bees. However, due to the shape of the flower, bees must exert considerable effort in order to access the resources due to its shape. Although alcylate clover is great for honeybees, it causes significant problems for both cattle and horses. The clover causes two syndromes, photosensitization and big liver syndrome. Big liver syndrome causes liver failure, neurologic disturbances, colic, diarrhea, and sometimes death. Although this species is great for bees, it is important that the species is not present in her fields to limit the potential harm to her livestock. The second plant that I found to be interesting was the yellow sweet clover. The yellow sweet clover is a fantastic plant for all pollinators, especially honeybees. Although it is considered a noxious weed in Alberta, it is an extremely important plant for honeybees. Yellow sweet clover nectar averages 52% sugar and 48% water, whereas most nectar is 20% sugar and 80% water. Yellow sweet clover yields enough nectar to make 250 to 500 pounds of honey per acre and leaves the honey with a sweet floral taste. My research was done on shrubs like the wild Saskatoon, choke cherry, snowberry, gooseberry, and buckbrush. I also looked at two different wetland plants, which were skunk cabbage and cattails. Sarah asked for information on a disease that was destroying Saskatoon shrubs and asked how to manage them. This disease is called fire blight and is very dangerous to plants with berries and fruits. Another special plant I was given to look into is the skunk cabbage. The smell of skunk cabbage is repulsing to humans and other mammals. It can also be very toxic to our stomachs. It's a different story for insects though. It smells delicious to them and planting a couple in a field of other plants can help draw the bees to them. Sarah mentioned how a neighbor has this plant on their land and it makes the honey smell very bad at first, but after a couple of days, it tastes great and smells great. I focused my research on the trees of the Aspen Parkland, including varieties of fir trees, pine trees, poplar trees, willow trees, the Manitoba maple, the pin cherry, beaked hazelnut, and the black hawthorn tree. For this section of the guide, Sarah asked us to find information on each tree regarding their ability to supply propolis to honeybees, propolis being used to line the hives, and with having antifungal and antibacterial properties. Multiple types of willows native to the Aspen Parkland were also researched as they are known sources of early nectar and pollen for honeybees due to their spring blooming season. Sarah also wanted information on the Manitoba maple tree since there are none on her farm and she is interested in the benefits of planting some. I also investigated the prevention and care of a common poplar disease, the hypoxylon canker, which affects the poplar and aspen trees commonly found in this ecoregion. It is highly transmissible and difficult to treat while also being quite deadly for trees like the balsam poplar, white poplar, and trembling aspen. The goal outlined to us by our sponsor was to create a guidebook with information tailored to her needs as a beekeeper in the Aspen Parkland. The guide we created included most of the information Sarah wanted us to find regarding blooming seasons, pollen or nectar supply, and habitat needs. However, we were unable to find information on extending the blooming season or the effects of specific plants on honey. Despite the challenges we faced, we believe the final booklet we produced could be a valuable resource for both Sarah's use on the farm 
and sharing with others in the beekeeping community. Thank you for listening. Any questions?